on the 29th of November, in the year of our Lord, 1705, we, Henry Pluchow and Bartholomew Ziegenbalg, left Copenhagen for the East Indies, according to the good will of God and the command of His Majesty King Frederick IV of Denmark and Norway, in order to preach the gospel of Christ on the Coromandel coast. Seven months after the Danish ship Princess Sophia Hedvig set sail from Copenhagen, Ziegenbog and Pluchow put ashore at Trankabar. There was no harbor. A side boat brought them from the Sophia through shallow waters to a sandy shore. There stood the Dansborg, proud and impregnable fortress built by the commander of the Royal Danish Navy to protect the interests of Denmark. It was a bold stroke of fate that had launched that new mission enterprise. Ordained but a few days before their departure, the two German pastors had set their course for a goal neglected for centuries, the bringing of a Christian witness to the people of India. For 80 years, Trankabar had been a possession of Denmark. In that time, the Danish East India Company had created a substantial trading center with the blessing of King Frederick. Now, with the arrival of Ziegenbaug and Plutschau, came the first attempt to create a substantial body of Protestant Christians, also with the blessing of the king. To be sure, there was a church for Europeans, but there was none for Indians. The Martoma Church had been established in India long before the Reformation, but this was the first Protestant missionary thrust. Communication was a major problem from the beginning. The men established their first contact with one of the European guards. Can you tell us how to reach the commandant? Come over to the steps. They were confident that the governing officer of Trankabar would give them a cordial reception, for Ziegenbaug carried with him credentials bearing the royal seal of King Frederick. They were escorted to a room in one of the government houses near the fort to await the commandant's pleasure. The first big step had been undertaken and completed. They had arrived and were ready to begin their work. While Pluchow, the older of the two men, shared his companion's vision, it was Ziegenbaug whose zeal sparked the venture from the beginning. Already he had adopted India as his home. Indians of the Coromandel coast depended on the sea for much of their food. Fishermen spread their nets to dry on the wide beaches after bringing in the morning's catch. Their most primitive craft was the catamaran, a kind of raft made of logs. Like the nets, they too were dried overnight. Ziegenbaug had come to India so that these fishing folk could hear the gospel. Was it possible that in his lifetime some might become fishers of men? When the men finally heard from the commandant, their credentials were abruptly taken away, and they found themselves stranded and alone. Puzzled by this perfunctory treatment, they insisted on an audience with the commandant himself. He was a busy man, no doubt, but certainly he would see them. They were asked to wait. Both Ziegenbaug and Plutschow had studied available writings about Hinduism and Islam, but the religious life of India was, for the most part, veiled in mystery. Ziegenbaug was determined to lift that veil. Yes, the Commandant was busy, but he would see them later, would the men return at the end of the day. There was no choice, of course. Fortunately, Modaliapa, the young Indian who had offered his services to them when they landed, 
was able to understand their difficulties and help them as an interpreter. They set off on a walk through the streets of Trancabar. Before its occupation as a European settlement, Trancabar had been a part of the territory of the kings of Tanjore. It still retained its traditional atmosphere. The founding of a Danish colony in 1620 had not materially altered the pattern of life. As Ziegenbarg looked about him, he began to sense the gulf that lay between him and the people of India. Differences in dress and custom were superficial distinctions that were signs of an underlying dissimilarity. In that tropical climate, life moved at a leisurely pace. But in the schedule of Bartholomew Ziegenbaug, there was no time for leisure. God's plan called for men of action. Day's end was signaled by the steady symphony of ox carts, as rice farmers left their fields for home and distant marketplaces. Returning to the Commandant's house, they were advised that he was still too busy to see them. A government clerk who learned that the men had no friends and no place to sleep invited the strangers into his own home. It was a welcome offer. Perhaps tomorrow would be less discouraging. Next morning, they were admitted into the presence of Commandant Hassius of Trunkabar. The interview was brief. The governor of the colony made it clear they could expect neither cooperation nor encouragement from the government. He suggested they return to Europe. It is apparent that what you deem best for India is the result of fancy and untutored speculation. We have no desire here to complicate further our relationships with the people and their established customs, whether social or religious. After all, my dear fellow, heaven is very high above our head and uh, Copenhagen very far off. Mark this. These men are troublemakers. They shall not build their little churches here. Almost immediately, the building of the little churches was begun. First on the schedule was Old Jerusalem, designed to meet the modest requirements of what the men hoped would be their first congregation. Ziegenbaug and Pluchow were members of a pietist group of their day, and as such could have been expected to shun organizing a church. Yet they included a house of worship as a major item in the first year of work. The problem of communication, however, became increasingly acute and made more difficult the accomplishment of the simplest task. They were constantly in need of an interpreter. Ziegenbaug turned at once to the study of the Tamil language. Ah, e. Ah, ah, e. As a first step, they invited a school teacher to their home to organize a class in Tamil for boys and girls. The men attended as regular members. Under expert instruction, they began the slow process of assimilating a strange language. They were spurred on by the progress of the children who came from a variety of backgrounds, Hindu and Muslim, some wearing the traditional marks of their caste, all eager to learn. Uh, uh. There were no textbooks and only the simplest tools for learning. It was early in their study of Tamil that the hand of providence reached into their lives and gave them new cause to be grateful to the God they had come so far to serve. 
The stranger's name was Aleppo, an educated Tamilian from west of Trankabar. He offered his personal services as a linguist and companion, an offer that was warmly welcomed and readily accepted. During that first year of study, Ziegenbaug came to know the people, and the fishermen repairing their boats near the shore by the fishing village. Men whose knowledge was the knowledge of the sea. Men whose lives were bound together by mutual need and common labor. Men whose faces were etched by the Indian sun and wind. Women, old and young, who helped the men exact from the sea a bare subsistence. Through the companionship of their friends, the men became familiar figures in Trankabar and neighboring villages. Ziegenbog's dedication to his freely chosen task impelled him to feel an early sense of oneness with the people. This, perhaps more than any one thing, accounted for his ability to win their trust. Ziegenbaug stood on the side of God and on the side of the people. He had no illusions about altering the social structure of India, in which each individual was literally born to his economic station and to his position in society. That would be a task for generations to come, change would be difficult and slow. There was a greater urgency than a ministry to the social ills of the country, or its economic problems, or even its staggering problems of health and sanitation. The sickness of India that cried for healing was a sickness of the spirit. In even the smallest village and town, one or more Hindu priests called the devout and the superstitious to the local shrine. What touched Ziegenbog most deeply was their worship of many false gods, the goddess of the forest and the handmaid of the goddesses, the goddess Parvati, Mohini, and Kali, the great triad of major deities, Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva, and scores of lesser divinities. The temple priests of Hinduism helped to preserve a caste system that denied change and progress in society as it denied freedom and growth in the individual. Never had Hinduism received the full challenge of the Christian gospel. No Protestant missionary had ever ventured to preach Christ to the fettered souls of India. Not until the arrival of Ziegenbaug on the Coromandel coast in 1706 was this facade of religious and spiritual stagnation breached. By the time eight months had gone by, Ziegenbaug had acquired a large vocabulary in Tamil and had begun to master the difficult grammar. He and Pluchau talked with the people in and around the Trankabar settlement at every opportunity, spreading the good news of the living water as they traveled. It was the individual soul for whom Ziegenbaug yearned. He had no illusions about establishing overnight a large congregation of believers. It had been the hope of King Frederick to create a small community of Indian Christians within Trankabar alone. But the vision of Ziegenbaug embraced a far greater increase for the kingdom. While he knew the dream could not be realized in his own lifetime, he also knew that the seed carefully planted today would yield an abundant harvest tomorrow. It was to further that future harvest that he sent Indian believers into the field to sow the good seed. Daliapa himself was a member of the first class for catechumens. Instruction had begun only four months after Ziegenbaug put ashore. These earnest inquirers strengthened their own faith by witnessing to their friends and neighbors. The work of those early days was slow, but it was painstaking and thorough.
Traditionally, it was the priestly caste of Brahmins who were the most highly educated group in India. Ziegenbaug deliberately sought them out and engaged them in long theological discussions. He dressed in traditional clothing as a sign of friendship. He found them to be willing listeners and intensely curious. Although they were well-schooled in Orient thought, they knew nothing of evangelical Christianity. They were familiar, however, with the concept of one God. In their own theology, this was the original all-pervading spirit of Brahman, the first cause. Ziegenbaug, like Paul on Mars Hill, directed the intellectuals to this unknown God, whom they could at last come to know fully revealed in Christ. In the sacred literature of the Hindus, the Brahmins found at best a highly developed philosophy. Through the pages of the New Testament, Ziegenbaug brought them into the living presence of a personal savior. For many years, Zion Church had been the meeting place of the European congregation of Trankabar. As a kind of gesture of goodwill, use of the building was extended to Ziegenbaug for a regular weekday service until such time as his own church could be completed. There, on the 12th of May in 1707, less than a year after his arrival, Ziegenbaug baptized five Portuguese-speaking Indians, first fruits of the new mission. We are buried with him through baptism into death that like as Christ was raised from the dead, we also should walk in newness of life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. There were other fruits in that first year of labor. With the help of Aleppo, Ziegenbaug completed a Tamil translation of Luther's small catechism. He then plunged wholeheartedly into the task of translating the New Testament. The new converts and the completion of the catechism were followed almost at once by a third significant event. In spite of meager funds and lack of government support, Old Jerusalem Church was finally dedicated. It was a small church, and it was a small congregation that attended its Sunday services. But it was a loyal and earnest fellowship that gathered there in August of 1707 for the service of dedication. It was the first Indian Protestant congregation in the land, meeting to worship their God in a building set apart for praise and thanksgiving. Mark this. These men are troublemakers. They shall not build their little churches here. But the first little church was built, and the Protestant mission to India was fully launched. In the following month, Ziegenbaug preached his first sermon in Tamil and baptized the first Tamil convert. These were the nucleus of what would one day become the great body of the Tamil Evangelical Lutheran Church. Ziegenbaug was translating the 23rd chapter of Matthew when the commandant brought his opposition to the mission out into the open. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to you, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Herr Ziegenbaum, you are under arrest. Very well, if the Commandant wishes. Don't interfere. It's an order.
so it was that in a prison cell in the Donsburg, Bartholomew Ziegenbalg reflected on what seemed to be the end of the first Protestant mission in India. Not long after his confinement, Ziegenbalg's acceptance of God's will and his continuing prayer for India's millions won the sympathy of one of the guards. Ziegenbalg was another Paul, steadfast in faith and witnessing even to his jailers. His repeated request for writing materials had been regularly denied. He was cut off from his friends at home and the little band of believers beyond the Donsburg gates. At his own risk, the guard had brought him paper and pen and ink so that he could communicate once more with those who could help him. Throughout, he continued in prayer, longing to speak the mystery of Christ to those who had not yet heard. God, somehow preserve and bless thy church in this land. More than six months after Ziegenbog's imprisonment, the Commandant and his wife accepted an invitation to lunch in the Donsburg cell. It was the government's first recognition of growing resentment against the missionaries' confinement. It was a strange sight, the impeccably groomed Commandant and his richly gowned lady seated with a prisoner of the state. Ziegenbog was a perfect host. For the arbitrary and willful past behavior of his honored guest, he held neither bitterness nor desire for revenge. The Commandant had acted independently without sanction of the King. That much Ziegenbog knew. But his only wish was to be free to further the work of the Kingdom in India. I think I have been badly advised in these matters, Herr Ziegenbog. You tell me that I am already forgiven. This is difficult for a man in my position to understand. Be assured, I shall make amends. Ziegenbog had been imprisoned in the Donsburg for nearly seven months when the Commandant released him. It was a day of rejoicing. He was already mature for his 27 years, and the weeks of confinement had seasoned him in understanding and judgment. He was a gifted leader, and the inspiration of his guidance had been missed. Now the work could move ahead. Soon it was agreed that Pluchow should return to Denmark to plead the cause of the church in India. Reinforcements of additional personnel from Europe were expected shortly. Pluchow would then be free to return home and gather reinforcements of additional gifts. By the middle of summer, Grundler had arrived with two others to strengthen and extend the mission. At the gate of the city, the men looked westward to the kingdom of Tanjore. Ziegenbaug had been in India for three years, but had been unable to penetrate very far beyond the limits of the Danish settlement because of the resistance of Indian rulers. There was also resistance right in Trankabar on the part of the Muslims. The gospel had been preached to the Hindus who had not known of Christ with encouraging results. But Islam already had made of Jesus merely another prophet and Muhammad had been made the mouthpiece of Allah. Allah. 
Ziegenbau gave much of his teaching time to the training of young men who he hoped would someday assume leadership in churches throughout India. Meanwhile, by 1711, five years after the beginning of his work, he had translated into Tamil the entire New Testament, a book on theology, a dictionary, and 40 hymns. He had proved to be a remarkable linguist and an untiring worker whose example fired his European colleagues with enthusiasm and ambition for the church beyond anything they had experienced at home. Students, too, caught his spirit. The church in India was on the move. New milestones were passed as the years went by. Among them, a complete reversal of the original attitude of Commandant Hassius. A Danish ship had arrived with financial help and letters of right and privilege from King Frederick. And in that same year, Ziegenbaug returned to Europe to report directly to the churches the status of the mission and to place before them the need and the challenge of India. If we consider the success of this mission from its first beginnings, it has not yet indeed been answerable to our desires. The iniquity of the times, the fewness of the laborers, the dignity of the employment itself, and our own insufficiency for it, have been the cause why this work has hitherto made no greater advance. But Almighty God, who is never wanting either to the planter or to the waterer, can give the increase to us or to those who may come after us. In this sure hope, I leave Europe to return to India again, imploring the Divine Majesty that he direct and prosper my endeavors. I promise myself your prayers and assistance in this work, and may Jesus Christ assist you always by his spirit, strengthen your minds by his divine power, and unite you by the bond of mutual love. After two years, Ziegenbaug returned from Europe to expand the school he had established before his departure, to found a seminary for training Indian pastors, and to erect New Jerusalem Church. New Jerusalem Church was dedicated on October 11, 1718, 12 years after the arrival of Protestantism in India. Bartholomew Ziegenbaug was more than merely the first Protestant missionary to India. He was the true spiritual forebear of today's Indian Christians. It was Ziegenbaug who first caught the vision of an indigenous church, a self-propagating and dynamic church with Indian leadership. It was he who had the foresight to establish the schools in which that leadership could be trained. It was he who possessed the linguistic gifts for translation so that by 1713, Christian books in Tamil were being printed by the Mission Press. It was his vision which conceived the creation of the original Tamil hymn tunes and words, both based on traditional Tamil forms. It was Ziegenbaug himself who translated the great Lutheran hymns so that congregations throughout India could join their voices with those of their brothers across the sea. Those glorious songs of praise were the very fruit of the labor and aspiration of a man who, in a prison cell less than ten years before, had written his testament of faith. For this great soul, even when in bonds, had been more free than his keepers. This is not the task of one man alone, nor indeed of one society. Nor is it, my friends, the task of but one people. Rather, our Lord commands the dedication of all Christians everywhere to the propagation of the gospel. And this dedication, 
will most certainly prove the perfection and the crown of all other victories gained hitherto. Since by this act alone will the knowledge of Christ at last cover the face of the earth as the waters cover the sea. And all the world will be full of the majesty of his glory.